Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to have y'all out this early and this morning for this uh, post-pandemic lecture. And we thank God that you were able to make it. I know it's early. And uh, I know some folks are probably just getting out of bed and they're on their way now. Uh, but I plan, I, I believe this is going to be a great lectureship. And uh, we're going to learn something from it. Yeah. And Dallas Hillside is very grateful that you allowed us to host it uh, as we just finished this building. And we're just so excited to have you here. Yeah. And so uh, after we have a song in the front, then I will come up uh, well, at 930. We will have our first lecture and we'll introduce him at that time. So we're going to go ahead and get uh, Brother Turner. He's going to come up and give us a song, give us a prayer, and then we'll keep singing until it's time for us to have our first lecture. And brothers, the mic is already preset, so you don't have to touch it. All you have to do is talk. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You all wake up this morning? <clears throat> In the Blue Book 29, if you have a Blue Book, look under your seat. If you just don't have one, look right under your seat, under your feet. Right under your feet, under your seat, you'll find the Blue Book. Good to see all my friends, Brother Rufus, and all these other creatures, and everybody. It's good to see you this morning. It's good for you to see me. That means we both can still see. <laughs> all right. I wonder when I. I woke up this morning with my mind where it was staying on me. Set in our right minds this morning. Yeah. We thank you for the privilege of prayer, Father. Lord, uh, we thank you for this time and this opportunity to come and share uh, with one another what we have studied over this weekend, Father. Yeah. Father, it is my prayer that the messages <coughs> can go out to this lost and dying world, Father. Yeah. But it's also my prayer that the brotherhood can hear was being preached. Yes. Uh, this, uh, this morning, Father, we pray for unity uh, amongst the churches of Christ. Mm -hmm. We pray for unity in this local area. Mm -hmm. And we're thankful for the man who had the foresight to come together to put this lectureship on, Father. Yes. Uh, Lord, we thank you for Dallas Hillside, and we just ask that you uh, bless their minister and bless the members here in such a mighty way, Father. Amen. Father, bless Brother Smith to hold up the bloodstained banner, Father. Yes. And we thank you for 
his contribution to the brotherhood, yeah. as well as all of these gospel preachers that are taking part over uh, this weekend. Lord, we just ask that you be with us as we share these messages. Lord, we just, uh, it is our prayer that someone might ask, what must I do in order to be saved? Yes. Yeah. But it is also my prayer that we walk away with a better and clear understanding of your word and of your will, Father. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Yeah. 
members are staying at home. They would rather watch TV on the boob tube mm. than to be in person. Yeah. I think that's a danger. Yeah. I feel like that's a danger to the church. Uh, we should be more responsible for being in person worship. And so this is the cause of it. They, we, we even have a subject that Brother Mike will be addressing the, uh, the AI movement. Right. Uh, that's taking over. Yes. Uh, that's taking over. AI, you, uh, it's saying, it's mimicking your voice saying things that you didn't actually say. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it should be a scary situation for us when it comes to the church because after a while, the church is going to be agreeing to things that we never agreed to biblically, but AI said it. And so, if we're not careful, what I'm saying is that we're going to adjust this now. Uh, let's start coming back to worship. Man. We're trying to promote men, women coming back to in-person worship. Yeah. Uh, like it used to be in old school. You, know, you, couldn't, you, you couldn't find a seat when you come out. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened to that? But I'm praying, I pray to God that you would take heed to what all of these men will be preaching on this week, uh, in the next two days, rather. And then apply it to your life so that the church can start looking like the church again. Amen. Brother like Brother Jerry said. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I did I did just want to mention that uh, we want you to know we want you to hang with us for these two days. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the Dallas Hillside is going to be serving lunch both days. Uh, and uh, right after lunch, there's going to be a men's session and a, 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 a later session. Uh, so the cause will be doing the later session, and uh, Brother Stephen will be doing the men's session in here. So if you all will hang with us and hang tight, we look forward to having a great time these two days in the lectureship. And we appreciate Dallas Hillside for hosting this. Amen. And so uh, I don't know if Brother Jim is going to mention it, but just a little bit of house cleaning. If you're not familiar with the building, the Facil restroom facilities for men and women is right in the front as you walk in the foyer. When we go for the lunch activity, it will be behind us in the fellowship hall. Before I forget, I'm um, asking Brother Cron to get a verse of a song to bring up the preaching. And I'm going to go ahead and dismiss uh, the Dallas Hillside ladies that are back there in the kitchen cooking. We appreciate them for the hard work that they're putting in. Man, uh, man. Uh, <laughs> all right. And so, church, I'm excited. Uh, this morning, uh, for this lectureship, this first our first speaker, uh, Brother Leonard Graves Jr. And I think the brothers picked the best uh, possible preacher for this subject. He's a great young guy, a uh, gospel preacher that's coming up. He's the minister of the uh, Church of Christ in Celeste, Texas. Uh, he's been preaching since 2012. Uh, he graduated from Brown Trail School of Preaching, same school as I, and a few others, uh, Brother Fisher. And uh, so I know he can preach because he's graduated from Brown Trail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he right. has an MBA in Business Administration. Uh, he also designed, created, and produced the flyers for this quarterly lecture. Mm -hmm. And say amen on that. Amen. Amen. So we're about to hear a great gospel preacher, a coming up preacher that sound in the doctrine, and we're very excited amen. to hear him. So after a verse of a song, the next voice you'll hear will be Brother Leonard Graves Jr. of the Celeste Church of Christ. Uh, so let's church Christ and say. Amen. I'm going to trade my earthly home for a better one, bright and fair. Christ left to prepare a mansion for children in the air. I'll join him in that land where tears or sorrows can be found. When I receive a mansion, mansion, robe, and crown, let's sing about a mansion, a robe, and a crown. It's there, I'll join him all the way in the Bible. So let me 
It's so good to see each and every one of you. It's been a while since I've seen some of you, and it's, it's uh, always an honor to be around like-minded saints. Amen. And uh, uh, Brother Rufus already told me to stay within my top, so uh, I'm going to go directly into my message. And my message is about preaching and sharing the good news throughout right. the world on social media. But it reminds me of a story uh, that I heard about. There was a new preacher in a small town in Texas, and, and he invited everybody he knew to the service. And uh -huh. Following a week, no one showed up. So he put an ad in the newspaper, and he said, uh, I'm going to have a funeral for this church, for this dead guy. And so a lot of people were very curious about the ad, and they went in and came to the service that he did. He did a eulogy for the church, and he even had a casket. He opened up that casket and asked people to come uh, to view what was in the casket. And what he had in the casket was a large mirror. Mm -hmm. He wanted them to know that they were the reason that the church had died. Mm -hmm. And I want us to know today that we can be that reason as well if we're not doing our part Amen. for the Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. But you ever had some really good news to share? A new car or new house, or just got married. Whatever it is, when we have good news, oftentimes, well, we can't wait to get on the phone and tell everybody, can we? All right. Tell everybody about the good news uh, that we just had. We got some even greater news to share with the world. Yeah. That Jesus died, that he was buried, but the best part, he rose up. All right. And because he was resurrected, one day, me and you will also be resurrected all those who have been baptized into his body. Right. Mm -hmm. That should give us some hope. And we should share this hope with the entire world. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of opportunity to do so. Yeah. Did you guys know that there's over 3 billion monthly users on Facebook? Mm -hmm. 3 billion. Mm -hmm. wow. 3 billion people that we can reach yeah. with the message of the gospel. The problem we have recently in the brotherhood is we have people reaching with the message of the gospel. Yeah. We have an opportunity to preach the good news of our Savior is risen. Amen. But so many people are focusing on other saints. I'm here today to encourage us to get off that and focus on the good news. Amen. Because we have too many souls that don't know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So Instagram has 2 billion monthly users. YouTube, where we live streaming today, has 3.7 billion users. Mm. TikTok, 1 billion users. So each one of these platforms offer us opportunity to share the good news. Paul told us about this good news. He said, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Yeah. 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 I want you to realize that Jesus himself gave us what we call the Great Commission mm -hmm. to go into the world and preach the gospel. Yeah. Tell his story. Tell what happened to him. That they put him on a cross, that they beat him, they tortured him, that they mocked him, they spat on him. Yeah. They beat him so bad, his back was unrecognizable mass. And they hung him up on that cross for the whole world to see. And they buried him in the tomb. But thank God for us, that wasn't the end of the story. Because he got up out that grave, and because of this, he wants us to share this message of hope with the entire world. So let's go to Matthew 28. That's where we're going to pick our text up from today. Matthew 28. I want to look at verses 17 through 20. As we attempt to share the good news with the entire world. The Bible says that when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to deserve all things I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Well, Since Jesus has all power after the resurrection, he gave each person that's a believer a mission. Amen. He said, if you believe in me, if you love me, I want you to do something. I want you to go. That means we can't have a ministry. We expect all the people to come to us. 
The ministry of the Lord has to be an active ministry. And I'm so grateful that God gave us so many opportunities to reach the lost. It's so different than when you think about it, when the first, the first century church, the Lord allowed the, the Greek language to be the personal language, the language for the whole world, where people traded in this language and it was a popular language. So God has always providentially provided for all his people to get the word out. And now he gave us a one way, another way to get this word out. And all it does is take the click of a button. Yeah. And all of a sudden, people in the world all over can hear the good news. Right. Amen. So since we can share all this other stuff, your new baby, your new grandbaby, all those things are good. Don't get me wrong. But how much are we sharing the gospel with our friends and with our loved ones? All right. How many of us want a thing like this on judgment? To where you have a loved one that you never told the gospel to. And they're you know, sitting in heaven. They look at you and say, why didn't you tell me? Mm. And it was your responsibility to tell them Because you are the light of the world. God has charged us to go. In fact, in Acts chapter 13 and 47, he says, I have appointed you as the light to the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. Yeah. So we got a mission to fulfill, to go into the world. And how was this done in the first century church? Well, let's go to Acts 20. We're going to look at verses 20 and 21. I want you to see how Paul talked publicly and he went house to house. Mm -hmm. He used every avenue available to reach the lost. He didn't cut no corners. Mm -hmm. He realized the importance of spreading his good news and he used every tool possible. Fresh. So the Bible says in Acts 20, 20 to 21, I have kept nothing that was profitable unto you, but it shows you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greek with penance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. He knew how important it was, how profitable it was for the salvation of man. Do you realize how profitable it is today? It's the same message then that saved. It's the same one that saves today. Uh -huh. And we got a mission to go out and teach you. It's going to Acts 5 and 42. Mm -hmm. So I want to show you what the apostles did every single day. They didn't say, well, we're going to wait for the Lord today. Wait for Sunday. And, you know, maybe we'll do something for the Lord. Well, they said, no. Every day it was important to get out God's word. So the Bible says that every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not stop teaching and preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. That's right, because brother. they realized how important yeah. it is. Mm -hmm. If people want to be saved, they have to realize that they have to believe in the gospel. Yeah, yeah. brother. And they believe the gospel, it's going to prompt their response. Yes. The next part is baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. If people want salvation, they have to know the truth. Yeah. So many uh, uh, thoughts of the talk today in, in the world. I think about the sinner's prayer. You turn on the television, go low, sing up. Tell you real quick. All you got to do is to believe in your heart and shout out your hey. That's not in the Bible. That's not what the Bible teaches. But we have to get back to the Bible. In fact, we know that this sinner's prayer came from a man named Yellow Go Weebop. In 1741, he stayed with what they called the Martyr's Man. He would have people come down. And, uh, and confess their sins, and all they have to do is confess that they believe and they were saved. Mm -hmm. And Billy Graham, and 200 years later, he made it to where he called the sinner's prayer. Mm -hmm. and I'm here to tell you that a sinner's prayer will not save you. Yeah. Yeah. You have to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And if you obey that gospel, you will be saved. But he says, but I, let's go to Galatians 1, 11 and 12. Galatians 1, 11 and 12. Because I want you to realize that this message that I'm teaching you and I'm quoting to you is coming from God's word, not from my own uh, thoughts and my own ways. It don't have to come from the word of God. And so Paul is letting it known too that this message of the good news is coming directly from God. He says, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached from me is not out of man, for neither it uh, came from man, neither was taught of man, but it was from the revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why it's such an urgent call for us 
to preach the good news. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Too much false doctrine is being taught in the world. Well, and I think about the people that are seeking the truth. That's why we create these different pages. You go online, I ain't trying to promote my page, but I have to tell you about it. I got a, a page called Church of Christ Sermons, a ministry of men of grace. Right now, we look to like 48,000 people that's in that group. Right. 48,000 people that get to hear the gospel every single day because I want to replicate what the apostles did. Mm -hmm. Every day, they was going and trying to teach the gospel. That's what I attempt to do with this site that I have because it's so important. There's so many people that's like Philip. They have a, uh, the, I mean, the unit and Philip. The, the unit has a sincere heart, but he just didn't know the truth. Yes, and there's so many people that we can help Find the truth with the good news. Come on, Marisa. Some people are so good, they donate to the Red Cross. They uh -huh. help the homeless, yeah. but they still are not saved. Mm -hmm. The unit didn't understand the gospel. But Philip didn't say, you know what? I'll wait the next week to tell you. The Bible says he ran to him because it was an urgent message. Yes, and I want you to know how many people have you talked to in the morning and in the evening time you heard they passed away? Well, the gospel message is too urgent for us not to share it with everybody we love. I never want anybody that I've ever known in life to tell me, why did you tell me about the good son of Jesus? Why did you tell me about the Lord's son? But I want to just funk. I just got to be talking about that sentence prayer. I want to just funk it right now. Let's go to Acts 8. And we're going to look at verses 30, 31. Because somebody out there might still believe in that sinner's prayer, but I'm going to debunk it right now. Mm, all right. The Bible says in Acts 8, 30 to 31, and Philip ran to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, you understand what you read? He said, how can I not? Unless some man should guide me. Bible. He desired Philip that he would come up to him and sit with him. Mm -hmm. So let's go down to Acts 8, 37. Go down to a few verses. Now, this is essentially what the sinner's prayer teaches that if you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, you shall be saved. But let's see what the Bible says. The Bible says in Acts 8 37, and Philip said, If I believe with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If the sinner's prayer was valid, right there he would have been saved, wouldn't he? Yes. But we realize he wasn't saved, but we're going to see the next verse. He said, But the eunuch. Realized he needed something else. The Bible says that he commanded the chariot to stand still and went down to the water and said, What? Both foot foot and he did what? He baptized him. Why did he baptize him? If he was already saved when he believed. Right. He baptized him because baptism is necessary for salvation. Yeah. And this is a message that we have to teach the word. Yeah. I want you to see three points from this particular text that Philip was not procrastinating. And he understood the urgency of each soul that we had to count. It's too important to wait to teach the good news. Mm -hmm. Also, I want you to see that the eunuch desired to know the truth. Uh -huh. And lastly, I want you to see that baptism was required. It didn't matter how good the, the eunuch's heart was. It didn't matter about any of those things. Because again, it's a lot of good people, the denominational church. That's right, brother. But unless they obey the truth of God, they will not hear the words that we will hear. Well done, my good and faithful servant. But it's important to have lost souls saved. Let's go to Luke 15. I'm going to look at a few verses here. Luke 15. And how much time do I have, brother? I got another, I got another 20 minutes. Huh? 15 minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> but Luke 15. The Bible says. Then he brought near unto him the publicans and sinners, and the Pharisees and scribes learned, This man he received his sinners and he was then. And he spake this parable to them. What man of you having a, a hundred sheep and lose one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, and go out to them with the blows until he find it? And when he had found it, he laid on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he came home, he called it together his friends and neighbors, and said, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Mm -hmm. I say unto you that likewise joy will be in heaven for one sinner that repented more than the ninety-nine persons which need no repentance. Uh -huh. You think about all the people that left the church when the pandemic happened. Well. Now, while we appreciate that God gave us this opportunity to get the word out, if they want to be saved, they can come back. Yeah. Amen. 
Because the Hebrews 10, 24, 25 tells me that the Lord expects us to worship collectively mm -hmm. together. Yeah. But I do appreciate the fact that some people may never walk into a building and still hear the gospel yeah. on YouTube and they can hear it today. Man. But I want you to see something else. Let's go to Mark 8 and 36. Because I want to ask you a question. If you had a loved one that was about to jump off a cliff, when you do everything you could to save them? Everything, brother. Everything, right? You do everything you could to save that brother. If you had somebody that fell down and you're choking on something, boy, you'd be trying to perform some CPR, right? Yeah. You do everything you could for that person. Why then don't we have that same attitude when it comes to the spiritual life of our loved one? <laughs> don't you know that's even more important? than anything physical that can ever happen to any of us, well, that we have to worry about their soul. The Bible says, what profit a man to gain the whole world? Lose his soul. Man. We got a lot of work to do. We got a mission to fulfill. Why? Because 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, 9 says, in flame and fire, taking avengers on them that do not know God, do not obey the gospel by Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. who will be punished forever and lasting destruction from the presence of our Lord and from the glory of his power. Y'all, this is serious business. Because once we die, the Bible says in John 9 and 4, that is, we cannot do any more work. That is it all. So what happens at that point is our faith has been decided. Mm -hmm. And if you die in sin, not obeying the gospel, then Jesus said, where he is, you cannot come. Amen. Uh, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, our sins and iniquities separate us from God. But, there is hope. Yes, there is hope. That's it, brother. In the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if you've been baptized and you continue to walk in the light as he is in the light, one day he's coming back for you and I. Yeah. He's going to come back for those who have died before us and raise us all with a body that looks like Christ. Well, Isn't that wonderful? That's glorious. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, 18-20, for as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things that silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, mm -hmm. as the lamb without blemish and without spot, who was buried and ordained before the foundation of the world, was manifest in these times for you. It's the blood of Jesus. Acts 4 and 12 lets us know there's no other name of the heaven whereby we must he saved. Well, but I want you to tell you some things about Jesus and what he did for us by going to that cross. He sent away our sins. He pardoned us. We were guilty. Man. But he said, you know what? I'm going to take out all your guilt and go to the cross and die for you because you know what? I want you to come back and I want to receive you. I'm going to go build a mansion for you as well. I'm going to bring you back home with me. That's what Christ wants for us. But he lifts up and burns away our sin. He cancels out our sin debt. Boy, I know I like to have some, some my student loan counsel or whatever else. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, ain't nothing like getting us to that, that sin debt counsel, though, right? And that's why we must obey and continue to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and so what is this gospel? Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And I'm about to close here. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Because this message is so important. And you don't have to, everybody think they have to know so much to yeah. spread the good news. Come on, brother. All you have to know is this. If you just remember this, this scripture right here and take this passage with you, mm -hmm. I promise you it's enough to save the whole world. Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you receive and where you stand. By which also you are saved. Uh -huh. Think about this, y'all. You don't have to even worry about being saved. Well, if you obey the gospel, you are saved. If you continue to walk in this way, well, you are saved. We said, if you keep in memory what I preach unto you. So that means you got to continue in his way, right? Yes. And, yes. and yes, you believe the vain, for I deliver unto you, first of all, which you've also received, how Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures, mm -hmm. he was buried. That he rose up on that third day, according to the scriptures. 
The good news is that Jesus conquered Satan, sin, and death, yeah. making him our Savior. He's our Savior. Yeah. He's our Savior. The Bible says in Psalm 129 and 3, that the clouds fly my back and made my furrows long. They beat Jesus so bad. It's kind of like when you get a meat grinder. You know you ever had a meat grinder and you start beating the meat and you put it back up and all of a sudden you got all kind of stuff that's still on that, on that grinder, right? That's what happened to our Lord and Savior's back. They tortured him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They, they tried to mock him saying, King of the Jews! They did this to humiliate him. They stripped him butt naked and put him on that cross for the whole world to see him. He disposed of all the evidence. Then he said some words that yes. resonate. It is finished. Yes. And he's going to say some words to us. Oh. Well done, my good and faithful yes. servant. This is the message of the gospel. Yes. And to get into the Lord's church, to obey the gospel, he's given us some also some other instructions. Let's go to Romans 6. Three and four. I mean, this is it. We're going to close out with this. Romans 6, 3 and 4. Because you may be asking yourself, Brother Gray, I want to obey that gospel. And I'm going to show you how to do it. Mm -hmm. Because it's so important for your soul. If you want to be saved, Jesus said that you must be born again wow. of the water and of the spirit. He told Nicodemus this in John 3. You must be born again. Yeah. Why? Because if you, you have to get rid of that sin that's in your life. Because Jesus, God don't deal with unholy. He even forsake Jesus because of unholy. Because Jesus took on the sins of me and you. And for all of those in the entire world, he took on that sin. So God has said, if you want to get rid of that sin, I got a plan for you. Mm -hmm. Let's go over that plan. Romans 6, verse 3 and 4. Because do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of his Father, so too we may walk in the news of blood. Amen. I want to encourage you today that if you obey the gospel, to continue to walk in his way. But I, you also have another responsibility to not only save yourself, but all your loved ones. Because yeah. you don't want any of your loved ones on judgment day saying, why didn't you tell me the truth? Mm -hmm. I know a lot of us don't want to lose our friends and family. We think those relationships are so important. Mm -hmm. But I'd rather lose a friend right now Boy. than to have someone on judgment day tell me, why didn't you tell me Boy. about Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Not a member of the body of Christ. I know I'm the first, but I still got to get my invitation. I just want to gospel. All right. Mm -hmm. And I want you to realize that you're not a member of the Lord's church, you can become one right now. We don't have to have a special day to baptize you. We can do it right now. Amen. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, all you have to do is believe that. If you believe that, you confess it before men. We're going to ask you a question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If you answer yes to that question, we're going to take you down and bury you in the watery grave of baptism. I just read for you Romans 6, 3, 3 and 4 to tell you what it does to you. It wakes you up. To a new life. It's like a newborn baby. Yeah. Free of all the sins in the world. Yeah. I hope I said something that encourages you. Uh, and, uh, it's time for the next speaker. All right. Amen. 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 Well, the did a great job. Amen. Amen, Amen brother. You did a great job. Very educational. A message. I know he would do a great job. Yeah. Uh, is uh, Brother uh, Rich will be here today? So Brother Erwin Johnson has uh, elected to go ahead and take his spot, and then we'll reach back and grab him. Uh, and so uh, Brother Erwin Johnson is a great gospel preacher. And, uh, he and I talk periodically, and I enjoy the conversations with him. And uh, he's a smooth dresser, got his own style. And uh, he's ready to preach. Uh, he's ready to preach about the gospel. Uh, and so, let's look at this. Can you get a song? I mean, uh, can you get a song in just a moment to bring the gospel up? And so, uh, he has a task in front of him. 
Uh, his message this morning is a mere COVID-19, a mere interruption, or a blessed disruption. Well, all right. And uh, we are excited to hear Brother Elwin Johnson. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Brother Johnson began preaching the gospel in 1982 and has served several congregations of Churches of Christ, including New Hope in Kilgore, Texas, Shepherd Street in Mount Pleasant, Texas, MLK in Supper Springs, Texas, Eastside in Garland, in Garland, Texas, and MLK in Denison, Texas. Brother Johnson joined the Throckmorton Street Church in July of 2000, and 14. He is married to Linda Prince Johnson. He attended Texas Southern University, Texas State <coughs> University, and Abilene Christian University. The next, of the, this, of the one verse of a song, the next voice you hear, Brother Elwin Johnson. Uh, 100. 100. <coughs> Y'all act like you're gonna live forever, okay? <laughs> not in this, not in this world. One of it. This world is not my home. home. My eyes are passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from. carries the connotation of causing trouble mm -hmm. as its goal, while interruption is usually happenstance. Okay. There is no evidence that COVID-19 is a blessed disruption, uh -huh. because there is no evidence that it was caused by troublemakers, okay. Wuhan, China, or anyone else. COVID-19 is not a mere interruption, meaning it is not happenstance, mm -hmm. but rather a consequence of sin. Yes, yes. When Adam and Eve mm -hmm. ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 2, verse 17, men and women have been dying ever since. Amen. And we should know this. But she, we shouldn't be contributing to rumor Amen. and falsehood. Amen. Amen. COVID-19 is like the great persecution that arose against the church, which was in Jerusalem. Both the persecution in Acts and COVID-19 caused deaths. 
both the persecution in Acts and COVID-19 resulted in an opportunity to win souls differently than before. Persecution in Acts caused souls to be won by physically going to preach. COVID-19 caused us to see the opportunity to receive all who come to us. So COVID-19 is neither a mere interruption nor a blessed disruption, but an opportunity to win souls in the modern era. Acts chapter 8 verse 1 reads, at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Yeah. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, yeah. except the apostles. Mm -hmm. Now, Scripture does not state that the Lord sent the persecution. In fact, the Lord prepared the apostles mm -hmm. for persecution. Yeah. In Matthew chapter 10 and the verse 23, Jesus told the apostles, when they persecute you in this city or any other city, flee to another. In other words, do not resist, but move on where you may be better received and continue to preach the gospel. Amen. Acts chapter 22, verse 17 and 18, supports this understanding. Then Luke records, Paul told them all, now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and saw the Lord saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly. For they will not receive your testimony concerning me. Although the Lord did not send the persecution, the effect was the same. If it was not for persecution, the church would have remained in its echo chamber in Jerusalem. And the gospel would not have spread to all nations. Romans chapter 8 verse 20 is one of my favorite verses. Paul says, get this, for we know, not think, we know all things work together for good, including persecution and COVID-19. All things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. What is God's purpose? To win souls. Yeah. If winning souls sound like a refrain, it is. Well. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 19. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. <coughs> And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Yeah. Get this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Notice that Jesus did not focus on the need to address the apostles' doubt mm -hmm. or worship, mm -hmm. meaning he didn't command them to, to continue worshiping him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Instead, the Lord focused on the apostles going and making disciples of all nations. God didn't send his son here to be worshiped. Well. God sent his son to win souls. Mm -hmm. Therefore, God's priority must be our priority. Because that's what makes us the church. That's it, really. On March 2nd of this year, LeBron James became the first NBA player 
to score 40,000 career points. Well. When asked about the unprecedented milestone, James says every player enjoys putting the ball into the basket and scoring. But the most important thing in basketball is winning games. Yes. The most important thing to every preacher and every member of the Lord's church must be winning souls. Amen. When promoting his God bless the USA Bible, even Donald Trump said, we must spread Christian values. Now, if Donald Trump sees the importance of spreading the gospel, you and I show sure up, excuse my globalism, see the importance of spreading God's word. Note that scripture does not share why the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. But they did nonetheless. Did not the Lord command the apostles to tarry in the city of Jerusalem, get this, until uh -huh. yeah. you are endued with power, power. from on high. All right, yes, so there was no need for them, Brother Smith, to remain in Jerusalem after Acts chapter 2. Mm -hmm. But they did. Yeah. Only Peter and John testified and preached the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. They returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Acts chapter 8, verse 25. Peter also goes to Caesarea and preaches to Cornelius and his household. Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 48. The book of Acts details how the gospel spread from Jerusalem to Rome on the back of preaching that was it's for instigated by persecution. As the gospel spread from Jerusalem to Rome, two preaching paradigm shifts occurred. Initially, Peter preached in group settings in Jerusalem, uh -huh. including the 3,000 in Acts chapter 2, mm -hmm. the 5,000 in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, Come on, and multitudes in Acts chapter 5, verse 14. Mm -hmm. The first paradigm shift, the first preaching paradigm shift occurred in Acts chapter 8, mm -hmm. when persecution arose against the church. Mainly, Ananias, Philip, Silas, and mostly Paul physically goes and preaches. Mm -hmm. Acts chapter 28, verse 30 and 31. <laughs> says, after arriving in Rome and being arrested, then Paul dwelt two years in his own rented house mm -hmm. and received all who came to him mm -hmm. preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ mm -hmm. with all confidence. Well. The, second the second paradigm shift involved Paul preaching and teaching all who came to him in his own place. Like Paul, we can preach and teach by receiving all who comes to us in our church field. COVID-19 has impacted our ability to knock doors because people are reluctant to answer the doors as before COVID-19. Homeowners Association covenants and apartment management restrictions are also impediments. In comparison to past decades, the effectiveness of winning souls by preaching in group meetings such as Crusades for Christ, Gospel meetings, lectureships, uh -huh. well, the visitors. Well, mm -hmm. have also impeded our effectiveness mm -hmm. to save the law, yes. especially among millennials and Gen Xers. Mm -hmm. Millennials ages 29 to 41 and Gen Xers ages 42 to 58 are important mm -hmm. because they represent families, 
and families grow the kingdom of God. Right. In Acts, souls of entire households were saved. Mm -hmm. And that must be our goal today. Mm -hmm. If they did it in the Bible, if they did it in Acts, I believe we can do it today. Right. Mm -hmm. So COVID-19 represents an opportunity for a paradigm shift Meaning it's an opportunity to change how we win souls yes. by receiving all who comes to us. Uh -huh. I've been trying to encourage my people, let's get folk into our building so we can set up one-on-one -on -one Bible classes. Preachers who are between the ages of 29 to 58 You've grown up in the internet mm -hmm. and social media age. You've grown up with these two. Mm -hmm. You are the experts. Help baby boomers like me <laughs> get out of the, our echo chamber and win souls in the modern era. Yeah. Yeah. We're in the soul winning business. Yes, <laughs> Businesses need customers to become viable, uh -huh. to be viable, and to remain viable. Several of us have invited Tony Brooks uh, to conduct gospel meetings, and uh, Tony did a great job. Mm -hmm. Now we need customers mm -hmm. to apply the lessons that Tommy taught. Mm -hmm. Help us to receive all millennials and Gen Xers who come to us and set up one-on-one open Bible studies. Someone said insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Wow. We need to wake up. Yeah. We need to open up our minds. We need to see the opportunities that lie before us. 75% mm -hmm. of millennials say of brands Social media presence impact their purchasing decisions. 72% of millennials are attracted by personal messages. Uh -huh. Nouns such as Samaritans, Eunuch, Jayla, Lydia, Saul, and Cornelius suggest that connecting with and teaching individuals on a personal, one-on-one -on -one level is the most effective way mm -hmm. to win souls. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing at, at Thrive Park. We baptized a young lady a Friday a week ago. Mm -hmm. Every soul that I have baptized in the last 10 years, every soul, Brother Johnson, resulted from one-on-one -on -one open Bible so, if you're between the ages of 29 and 58, help us to receive all millennials and all Gen Xers who come to us. Teach us how to do it. Gen Xers depend upon the internet and social media at about the same rate as millennials. Where are the young people? On the internet. Digital marketing. Uh, I thought I saw uh, the do Rose come in. <laughs> we spent time with her, Linda and I, a couple of nights ago, talking about how we can improve our ability to connect with millennials and Gen Xs <laughs> using the internet and social media. Digital market, blog. <coughs> Podcasts, local search engine optimization, newcomer mailing lists, and hosting community events represent opportunities to connect with and receive all who come to our church building. Man. If local churches don't have an accurate and inviting web page and own their own domain, this is what I was looking for, Brother DeRoe, it will be impossible for this age group to reach us. Well. Since I resume in-person worship, 95% of growth at Throckmorton is a result of the internet. 
Just about everybody who comes through the door has found us on the internet, has Googled us. Let me ask you. I've lived long enough to know that folk are going to be folk, and folk don't do what folk want to do. Mm. Brow beating them is a waste of time. Yes, we live stream on Zoom, Brother Smith, and Facebook, and I'm happy to be able to preach to folk on social media because I'm convinced it's the only hope of softening those hearts and getting them to return to in-person worship. And I'm especially helpful, happy rather, to be able to minister to those who are truly sick and shut in. Well. Now, my problem with social media is that it's an echo chamber. Brother Graves, he's got 400,000 followers or whatever it is. All of my followers are church folk. <laughs> Therefore, I need help in terms of trying to understand what I can do to enlarge my followers, yeah. to include non-believers. Well, in closing, someone said, when the wolf appears, the pessimist spent all of his time worrying about how he can keep the wolf from his door. The optimist refuses to see the wolf until the wolf bites him in the seat. Yeah. But the, oppor the opportunist invites the wolf in. Uh. And the next day you see him wearing a fur coat. Yeah. <laughs> so let's be opportunistic. Yeah. Let's invite the wolf in and win a soul or two. Yeah. Mike Crossman. And appear the next day wearing a fur coat. Yeah. <laughs> so COVID-19 is neither a mere interruption nor a blessed disruption, but rather an opportunity to win souls in the modern era. Amen. Amen. So thus, I, I, I pray that I've given you an appreciation and understanding what a wonderful opportunity that we have. Yeah. And I'm going to say this in closing. Lynn and I passed a church, the One Community Church, on 121. I remember it was a vacant field, a uh, uh, brother uh, uh, Crosby. <laughs> and so the first started church, I couldn't call. Then we saw the church have 100 cars. Next day we looked. It had a thousand, over a thousand cars that built two or three buildings. That man is not knocking doors. He's not having gospel meetings. He's reaching folk using social media. Yes. And I believe that, no, I know there's an opportunity out there for us to spread the truth. Yes. So we got to open up our minds. Yes. We can't be closed minded. Yes. We got to remember what Einstein said. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Yeah. I hear the floor. Amen. That was a great message by Brother Elwood John. Yeah. Yeah, great message on uh, a mere interruption or a blessed disruption. Did a great job. Yeah. He said a word in that lesson that I was going, I should have wrote it down. Uh, 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 what was that word? Grammarian or grammar? What did you say? You just said, he said some word. And uh, I said, I'm going to look that up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. Paradigm. Paradigm, maybe. No, that wasn't it. It was, it was uh, I think, some of the people. Nevertheless, I'll go over your message. I'll okay. <laughs> send it to you. All right, all right, all right. And so you did, did a great job. We're doing Man. very well. I appreciate you guys for getting up this early in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you for getting up this early. Uh, and you brought up Brother DeRoe.
And Sister Darrell, you leave the Darrells alone. Because <laughs> <laughs> the Darrells belong to Dallas. <laughs> so uh, you did a great job. I mean, we're doing very well. And uh, so uh, Brother Curtis uh, Rickwood has uh, made it in. And he has a very uh, controversial subject, the sanctity of life, a lesson on abortion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a tough one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody don't want to touch that one. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but uh, he decided, I think he can handle it uh, by reading his bio. The, bi uh, the bio says that uh, Curtis Richwood is a minister of the Scary Church of Christ in Scary, Texas. <laughs> and is currently, did I pronounce that correct? Scary. 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 Now listen. Yes. <laughs> you know what? It might be this microphone. <laughs> and this microphone is brand new. The system is brand new. And uh, so uh, I went back into the back. And, uh, to my wife. You know, my wife, she always told me about it. Now, we've been at school, but don't you be mispronouncing words? <laughs> and I went back to that, and I said, baby, how do you pronounce this word? And she said, it's uh, scary. And I'm scary. saying, like, scary. 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 Okay, so I guess it just came out scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, brother. So, uh, is, uh, currently employed with the Dallas Independent School District. Uh, his evangelistic work uh, has allowed him to serve locally, nationally, and internationally. He has been involved in the prison ministry in Texas and the state of Illinois. Curtis is a graduate of Brown Trail School of Preaching and earned a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Bible from Faulkner University. He is also a graduate of the University of Mississippi and Grand Canyon University, where he received a master's degree uh, in educational leadership. Brother Richwood was married uh, to his late wife, Yolanda, and they have two children, uh, Jada and Jeremiah. So uh, we're going to ask uh, Brother Turner to give us another verse of a song. And then after that, the next voice you would hear would be our brother Curtis Rich Richwood. One night then. One night then. Thank you. Take my time 
and deal with this. I know I have 30 minutes, and last time I preached on the lecture ship, I was so glad to be on the lecture ship, I ran out of time. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I told Bruce, my buddy back there, I said, you know what? We need to stop playing and don't preach. <laughs> So I'm going to go ahead and deal with this this morning. Again, I appreciate it. Look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 39. And I want to, the thing about uh, preparing a lesson like this, there's so many ways you can go and there's so much information. I think the difficulty is trying to simplify it. Mm -hmm. And so I want to, to listen as I uh, simplify it the best way that I could. And uh, hopefully we have an understanding from the Word of God. What does God want us to know? All right. And so when I looked up the sanctity of life, and it says a lesson on abortion, uh, life is basically when you get into the sanctity of life, life is extremely valuable. Uh -huh. uh, life is precious. And life should be protected. Well, man. Now I noticed something when I went to Luke chapter 1. Look at verse 39. It says, <coughs> Now at this time, Mary arose and went in a hurry to uh, the hill country, to the city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. Uh -huh. It says, When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, Mary's greeting, the baby, notice that, mm -hmm. the baby leaped. Mm -hmm. Now the Greek word there is prepros. And so it's the baby leap. Now watch, watch what I'm going with this. But notice the baby leap in her womb. That's on the inside. All right. Mm. And it says Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are the young, blessed are you your, among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So she's talking about a baby on the inside. Amen. Amen. Now the Greek word is preparos. Notice he said in verse 33, and how has it happened to me that uh, the mother of my Lord would come to me and behold when the sound of notice this on the inside. For behold, when the sound of your breathing reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And so that's happening on the inside. And, uh, so you see there's some emotions going on on the inside. You see yeah. that the baby is alive. Now I want you to Look at chapter 2, uh, and verse, uh, we'll go to chapter 2, and verse 11. Watch this, notice the outside. Uh, it says, uh, verse 11, for today is the city of David that has been born that's, uh, for you, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby that's Petro, it's the same Greek word. See, Petros are wrapped in clothes and are lying and lying in a manger. And so it's the same Greek word for the inside and the outside. Yeah. And so when I looked at this, I was talking to a, a, a friend of mine, Bruce, and I said, you know, uh, you know what matters really is what happens on the inside. And then, of course, he said, well, what you talking about? I hung up on <laughs> <laughs> I want to. <laughs> but really, when I said that, and I thought about that, what really matters is what, what, uh, what happens on the inside. And so we know that there is life on the inside. The question is, where uh, does life begin on the inside? Yeah. Uh, that's the question. Well. So I decided to look up the Hebrew word for conception. And to simplify it, it's, it's to be with child. All right. So notice at conception, uh, she is with child. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Now I want you to stay with me because when we get to abortion, I want you to have an understanding why I'm dealing with it this way. <coughs> uh, and so, but notice this. you got to catch this. Now remember, the Hebrew word for conception is to be with child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But watch this. In 2 Samuel 11, 5, the woman conceived, and she said, notice what that she said to David, and told David and said, I am with child. That's our conception. Now watch. Notice what Job says uh, about himself as a boy. All 
He said, let the day perish on which I was to be born. And the night was said, a boy is conceived. You understand? You have to pay attention to catch it. He said, a boy is conceived. That's our conception. So we see that according to the Bible, uh, at conception, a woman is with child. Now, that's how God planned it. And you know how it is when people want to do something, they begin to uh, reason, uh, I guess we want to say reason unscripturally. Well, uh, and so, but what is the, notice, uh, what's that, what's that, uh, that, what do they call it, biogenesis? Uh, you can't have life without life. Man, man. If there's a life, then someone has given life. Then, you know, you have to have life to get life. Amen. And so I looked at Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Stay with me. Watch this. I'm going to read this. Now, if you'd like to turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, I have it here in my notes. But I want us to get this, especially to the young people. It says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils. You see that, that the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so this is the beginning of life. Mm -hmm. uh, God breathed into his nostril. And so, and man became a living soul. Now remember I said that's the beginning of life. Uh, life has to begin somewhere. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, when I thought about this, you do what uh, the apostles did, and when they were dealing with uh, women in, in the positions and the man position, they went way back to the beginning. <coughs> uh, when Jesus was dealing with marriage and divorce, what did he do? He went back to the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so as we deal with abortion, what do we do? We go back to the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And so notice, but notice the first part. This is very interesting. The first part says of that verse, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Now that's the first part. And so as I thought about that, Man was, and you know that he was fully developed. And, and so when a woman was created, she was fully developed. So everything was intact. Mm -hmm. The reproductive system, the cycle, the, the brain, the heart, whatever you want to say, was all in order. He was created as a full-grown man. Mm -hmm. That's showing the power of God. But there's no movement. It's like he's from the dust of the ground, but uh, there's no movement. Everything is there, but there's no movement. James said, uh, uh, you know how James said, the body without the spirit is dead. Yeah, yeah. And so there has to be some movement. That, and that's why the Bible says, what, but what's the next part? The next part, the second part, and breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Yeah. Now here comes activity. Here comes the movement. Uh, they receive their spirit from God. They receive life. But I like that when I saw that there's no movement. There, uh, he he creates man from the dust of the ground, and everything is there, ready to move, ready to do something. But you can't do anything until God gives you life. Man, yeah. man, man, man. So, notice I like this one, Job thirty-three four. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Yes. See. And so this is where it started from, and God as our creator has a right to uh, put it in the order that he wants to put it in. It's his creator order, it's his cycle. Yes. There's a reproductive system that he created. Uh -huh. okay. And so he and so when he when he breathes into the nostrils of man became a living soul, the body was the way he established it to be. It's like how he wanted it. Mm -hmm. and, and but notice when he did that, watch this. Notice in chapter 4 and verse 1 of Genesis, now the man had relations with his wife because there's life. Mm -hmm. See, now they can do something. Mm -hmm. and, and she could, but notice that. But notice right there when we're introducing this, the Bible says, and she could see. Yeah. Well, I know they're living because the Bible says a man had relations with his wife. But notice what he said. The Bible says, in the beginning, the man had relations with who? His wife. And notice one day, when they had relations according to the law of God, she conceived. Uh, that's the beginning of life. Now remember what I said. Remember the Hebrew word, conception, 
uh, uh, conception is to be with child. Mm -hmm. And so right there, as I see, she conceived, that, that's telling me she was with child. child. Mm -hmm. uh, now, now, watch this. So she conceived, you see that right there, first of all. And notice this, that's number one. And gave birth to Cain. And notice what she said. I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. See, this is what God, this is how God put it together. It's his, it's his development. It, it, it's all about his creation. This is the order that, a system that he put together. And he lets us know that at conception, well, let me, let, let me show you something. Let me, before, you know, sometimes when you enter your lesson, you start getting ahead of yourself. You've got to pull yourself back. Amen. <laughs> I, 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 you know, watch this. So Ruth, or rather, so Boaz, notice this. So Bo Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. See that? She became his wife. The Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. But you notice how they say, the Lord enables her. Amen. See, the Lord enables her. See? Notice this. And the angel, Job, Job chapter 13, verse 3, and the angel of the Lord appeared to uh, uh, the woman and said, uh, uh, Indeed now you are buried and have borne no children, but you shall perceive and bear a son. That's Judges chapter 13, and verse 3. But notice how the, the order right there, you shall conceive and you shall bear a son. You shall conceive. You see that? That's the order because there's life at conception. Yes. Then I went to some medical experts to get a little deeper. And I realized that they go a little deeper, but they, 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 they're saying what, what, what's in the Bible. It's, that's how God created it. But a lot of the medical experts like to go against what God's system is. You know how God created mankind and things that he put in his body, her body, and they like to go against that just to uh, uh, try to substantiate what they're trying to say. Yes. Uh, all you have to do is go back to the Bible. Yes. Amen. Like what John says, stick to those things that you have learned from the beginning. Yes. Yes. Paul said, do not think beyond what is written. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. See, that, that's where we go. But watch what the med so, uh, There's a lot of medical experts on, on the biblical side. I just named a few for a particular reason. Well, watch this. Watch how I do it. Says American College of Pediatrics says, quote, the predominance of human biological research confirms that human life begins at conception. Mm -hmm. That's outside the Bible. Mm -hmm. All right. See, they did their research. Yes. Right. Landrum B. Shettles, MD, PhD, says, now watch this. The zygote, now stay with me. Now remember this word. The zygote mm. is human life. Now watch. I'm going to repeat it. The zygote is human life. He says there is one fact that no one can deny. Humans begin at conception. So watch. Notice what he says here. The zygote is human life. And so I have to go and, 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 and go get into it and go back into some books that I have and thank God for the internet. Amen. If you use it right. Amen. Now watch this. The, now I want you to listen to this. The forming of the zygote. Listen. The female eggs are in the ovary. See? The female eggs are in the ovary. There's a point when the egg leaves the ovary, right? Travels through the fallopian tube and enters the uterus, that's the womb. Watch this. During intercourse, millions of sperm cells race up to the uterus. The fastest one, the winner, will get to the egg first that one fertilizes the egg. When that happens, the zygote is formed. That's the beginning of a life. Amen. That's interesting. Amen. And I thought about, you know, I, I heard, see, I've been watching the, and I'm going to skip my lesson, and I, I, I've been watching the, the, uh, the, the NCAA March Madness, and I can't get away from it. So yeah. I forgot that I can't do those things anymore. You see, I can't walk. <laughs> you see, and, and so, uh, but then I saw this, I said, well, at least, um, well, let me leave that alone, because I know there's something that it says a maze of sperm cells race up to the uterus. And, and so those men who get married, 
we still have something inside that can raise. <laughs> I'm trying to be. You know, I son. When, I say something, when I'm preaching at church and I say something funny, he sits back there looking like he ain't got no sense. <laughs> I told the same dude, I said, I'm tired of y'all giving me sympathy, but I have to say something. <laughs> but notice the zygote, the PhD, the medical experts say the zygote, when the zygote is formed, that's the beginning of a new life. That's how God. Put it together. Amen. And so watch this. And so the zygote then turns into the embryo. The embryo becomes a fetus. The fetus turns into a neonate, a newborn baby. The neonate makes the transition from the womb to the outside world. But watch this. If there is no zygote, listen. Amen. There's no embryo. Amen. If there is no embryo, uh -huh. then there's no fetus. That's right. If there's no fetus, uh -huh. then there's no neonate. That's right. If there's no neonate, then there's no transition. Man. The fact that she has an embryo, the fact that she has a fetus, the fact that she has a neonate, the fact that the neonate is able to transition from the womb to the outside world because of the zygote, the beginning of the life. Amen. 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 When I say that, I don't know. I, you know how sometimes you're doing something get goosebumps? Yeah. <laughs> I said, I ain't gonna call Bruce, I think I need to call Shannon. <laughs> <coughs> I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18, and I want you to, I want you to notice something. We know that uh, this was God's creation. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, and verse 18. And I noticed something when you get into the providence of God and, and how God uh, opened up their womb when the woman could not have children, that means uh, they were buried, you could not have children. Mm -hmm. And But I noticed that God stuck with the cycle. You notice that. In the book of Judges, when he told uh, Samson's parents that they're going to have a shoe buried and they're going to have a child, and it happened at conception. Yes. You see that uh, when Sarah and Abraham, when she was buried, could not have children, uh, and when it happened, it happened at conception. Yes. Because that's where life begins. And, and I, I'm going to repeat myself because now we get to abortion, and we're going to get there real soon, you have to understand that it'll tie in together. But notice this. Watch this. In verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his, mo when his mother Mary had been betrothed uh, to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Miraculous. Amen. Never been with a man, a virgin. Man. But notice that the Holy Spirit could have done it any kind of way. Yeah. Remember, he created man and woman full grown. Man. And so, but, and so she, found, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. Uh-huh. But when he, when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, <clears throat> son of David, do not be afraid uh, to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived mm -hmm. in her uh -huh. is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and, and, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Yeah. See? Man. And you notice that he stuck with the cycle that he created. Yes. Man. Now, I, I, of course, that was fulfilling prophecy, but then I thought, well, if he wanted to, yeah. Jesus could have started as an embryo. Yeah. If he wanted to, Jesus could have started uh, as a fetus. If he wanted to, Jesus could have started as a neonate. But no, Jesus started at the point of conception Amen. as a zygote. And so which means to me, as I look at the system, that at one time Jesus was a zygote, yes. at one time he was an embryo, yes. at one time he was a fetus, yes. at one time he was a neonate, yes. neonate. And so that means he made the transition yes. for a transition as a neonate from the womb, the uterus, to the outside world. Man. Uh, he was deity, but he also was fully human. Man. Notice the value, how valuable this is. Yeah. Man. I don't think I'm running out of time. Uh, I'm time. Yeah, I got time. I got you. Uh, all right, thank you, brother. Uh, 
Leviticus chapter 24. In Leviticus chapter 24. Notice the how valuable uh, this is to God. Life at the point of conception is extremely valuable to God. I like what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 1 5. The Bible said, Notice what God said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1 5. Before I formed you in the womb. Yeah. Amen. I knew you. Amen. But notice what God went. He stuck with his cycle, his yeah. system. Yeah. He said, before I formed you in the womb. Yeah. Yeah. So now we have man come along and saying, uh, life starts after conception, or life starts here. The Bible said it starts at conception. Amen. Now, not, now let me go back, and not just life, a new life. Yes. Amen. Because you remember Adam and Eve, and when they knew each other, and uh, she could see that's life, uh, starting a new life. Man. See? Man. In order to have uh, a new life, you have to have life. And that's the law of biogenesis. Man. But watch. Notice this. This is very interesting. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 17. Watch this. If a man takes the life of any human being, he shall surely be put to death. That's on the outside. They're going to Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21. That's on the outside. Exodus chapter 21. Watch this. And so that's life on the outside. Exodus chapter 21. And I want you to look at verse 12 first. He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. Life for life. That's on the outside. Mm -hmm. Life for life. Mm -hmm. See? Uh, look at verse 14. If however, if however man acts presumptuously toward his neighbor so as to kill him craftily, you are to take him even from the altar that he may die. Life for life. That's on the outside. Yeah. That's on the outside. Uh, let's go to the inside. Watch this. Look at verse 18. Um, verse 20. Let's go to verse 22. If a man struggles with each other and strikes a woman with a child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet there is no injury, he shall surely be fined as the woman's, uh, fined as the woman's husband made a man of him. There's no prison system now, so he's going to be fine. Yeah. But he caused some damage on the inside. Yeah. Because there's life on the inside. But notice this. Now, this is an accident. This is not done on purpose. Now, I want to emphasize that this is an accident. Now, watch. And so, it says, look at verse 23. But if there is further injury, then you shall appoint Life. As penalty, life, life for life. life. That's on the inside. Yeah. Amen. And so life is valuable on the in outside to God. It's just as valuable on the inside. Now let's go to abortion. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. What's this? Five minutes. He said, I have ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> An abortion is a termination of pregnancy before the fetus is viable. Now that, that's one definition, but that's a good definition. The ninth week of conception, the embryo develops into a fetus. But life begins at conception. Man. So abortion has the, it's at the point of conception, it's conception. So abortion, you're terminating life. If there's no life, then why you have an abortion? You're terminating something. Yeah. Man. The fact that there's an abortion, there must be life because you're terminating something, which means you're terminating life. Amen. 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 And I looked up this, the abortion pill, and, you know, this says we're not ignorant of the, uh, the devil's devices, and I, I think these are all part of his devices. And it's an abortion pill is followed by another medicine called uh, miso, uh, prosto, prosto, which makes the womb con contract causing cramping and bleeding, similar to a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. 
Doctors usually perform them in the first trimester or the early part of the second trimester. The first trimester lasts from conception, see, from conception to week 12 of pregnancy. Suction, aspiration, and dilation of evacuation DNA are the two kinds of surgical abortion procedures. Each one involves the suctioning of the embryo from the uterus. Wow. There's probably, they say, 900 or 109, 800, 900 abortions that goes on here in this country. Abortions that go, I mean, that's, that's children in life. Man. So, since the Bible teaches life begins at conception, and abortion happens at the point of conception, then abortion is taken an in innocent life. Yes. Man. That's just biblical teaching. Amen. Amen. The Bible says, in Exodus chapter 23, verse 7, keep yourself far from the false matter, a false matter. Do not notice this. Notice what I said. Conception then is a, is a, a conception in abortion, you are taking uh, taking an innocent life. Because that spirit, that child, that baby has not done anything. Amen. No sin, pure innocent. And, and, and these methods of abortion uh, terminate this life that begins at conception. Yeah. As an innocent life, notice how God feels about that. He says in Exodus chapter 23, verse 7, keep yourselves far from a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not justify the wicked. Uh, look at uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 17. These six things the Lord hates, yes, yet sir. seven are an abomination to him. Listen to this. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed yes, innocent blood. Yes. Now, I, I'm going to skip my next point because if he says three minutes, that means I have, what, one minute left? At a time. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. I, I, I appreciate this lesson because uh, uh, we all need to hear it. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Uh, this is a serious matter. There are, uh, what I say, uh, 800 to 900 abortions. Uh, they say it goes on in this country uh, yearly. It, it's probably more than that. Amen. You can take a pill. I think now you can do that at home. Yeah. But it's still terminating life. Amen. Amen. And I'll say this at the end, the last part we're going to be, how to avoid that, and I'll just leave it like this. Men and women, let's stick to God's plan. Amen. 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 If David would have stuck to God's plan, Amen. would have been no adultery, Amen. Would, have been, would have been no murder, Amen. everything would have been just fine. Amen. Yes, sir. So the key is to stick to God's plan. Amen. 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 That's why I say, man. Amen. Man, that was a great lesson. Amen. Amen. I mean, he broke it down. You can't even argue with him. Uh, <laughs> he broke it down. Amen. Man, you know, uh, so, uh, Brother Fisher, would you give us a song in a moment? Uh, Brother Turner got tired. <laughs> uh, he stopped coming to the pool. Yeah. So we just cut the distance short. We just start singing from the boat. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, uh, the boss said, we're going to give you guys a break before the next message, and then we're going to have lunch after that. So, at this time, we're going to go ahead and break for about, about 15 minutes, and then we will have our next speaker. Thank you. Thanks.
I can't stop it. Don't let it go. Don't let it go. Praise the Lord. Eighty five. Yeah.
Yeah, Wayne. Girl. Looking Father. 
Yes. And so we thank you, God, that you have God, that, that we can pray you for your providence, and we don't leave us ourselves to deal with the things that befall us. All of these things, Father, together we can say. Thank you, Lord. Asking you to bless this gathering. We are thankful for this occasion. We are thankful, Father, for the encouraging messages that are brought from your word yes. to help sustain us in our fight against Satan, to help sustain us, Father, in carrying the gospel. Amen. We are thankful for the brethren who have given their time to look into your word and encourage us. Mm -hmm. We pray that our hearts and minds might be open to receive the things you have us to know. Whereby we can just do better service for the yes. go forward. All of our collective efforts, would you please be with us? Father, we live in, in uncertain times, but we live in troublesome times, and turmoil is, 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 is even affecting our congregations. And the devil is doing all he can to yes. throw us off track. Yes. Yes. We're just thankful that we have this time to focus and regain our, uh, our focus and to move forward, bless our individual congregations, those who are staying loyal to your way and to your word. Mm -hmm. Give us the courage to keep doing the right thing and speak over where we ought to speak. Amen. And even though this is a lectureship occasion, we still take the time to remember those that our duty binds us to remember in prayer, those who are sick and those who are afflicted with the maladies of this life. We're praying for our elderly and those who are shut in who really wish to be with us who can't be yes. praying for mournful hearts who have lost loved ones praying for all of those father who are falling victim to the problems of life but help us to know that our joy is in knowing father that you are able and through your power the power of christ we can overcome bless <clears throat> those who just make up in their minds that we're going to overcome all of the obstacles that satan puts in our yes. way yes. We can say much, Father. All I want to say right now is just thank you. You're the kind of God that loves us and keeps us. And, and, and we are not left to our own devices. Amen. We praise you, Father. Help us to stay true to your gospel, true to your word. May this end up in the end. We can say it was a successful lectureship. Bless all the men who have taken part. Bless all the men who have put it together. And then, Father, we just say, at the end of it all, we count it a success simply because it's based on your word. Amen. Yes. Amen. We count it a success for one person decides that we're going to be focused and go forward yes. based on your word yes. and not based on our own ideas Amen. and our thoughts and devices. Amen. Bless us in all that we do in my prayer. Help us to be satisfied with whatever you give us. Yes. And I can say, your grace is enough. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 That was a nice little break. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so uh, before our next speaker, um, after the speaker, we're going to enjoy a nice lunch. A hot lunch. So let's say amen. 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 And uh, we want to thank Sister Valerie Thompson for over. <laughs> Uh, the comment of the food here at Dow Hillside. She always does a great job with her committee. And uh, well, I'm excited. I, I went over there just to see how, what it smelled like. And I am excited. I'm, 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 I'm ready to eat. Uh, but I'm ready to hear Brother Bruce Smith first. Amen. He's one of my brothers. Amen. And, uh, uh, you know, before we get to that, uh, you know how you buy a new car? Oh, yeah. You know about a new car? Yeah. 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 Well, well. And you don't let nobody get in your new car with no food and drinks and soda. Yep. You get agitated and ready to fight somebody getting in your new car. Well. Put some food in your new car. Drop a fish fry. Put <laughs> food in your new car. Yeah. This is our new car. <laughs> you can be anywhere you want to. <laughs> Except in here. Amen. 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 If you got some water bottles, take them with you. <laughs> so, uh, uh, one of my buddies, and, and, and we've become good friends, and uh, Brother Bruce Smith, and uh, he's going to preach on the lost art of parenting our children. Amen. Uh, now, this subject is just as tough as uh, the abortion subject. Yeah. 
Because parents are different now than yeah. they used to be. Yeah. See, Sister Woods right here, uh, and Brother Woods, uh, uh, they trained us from East Dallas Church of Christ. Yeah. yeah. And, and my mother's sitting right here. Man. And if I got out of line with Sister Woods, uh, Sister Woods could just uh, pop me. <laughs> and then I'd be afraid to go back and hope she didn't tell my mother about it. Amen. Amen. Huh? Amen. But now it's not like that. Amen. Amen. Parents don't want you to. They don't want you touching their kids. They let their boys dress like girls and the girls dress like boys. Yeah. And so this is a touchy subject. Yeah. All right. And so uh, Brother Bruce Smith, uh, uh, he was born and raised in Marshall, Texas. He currently serves as minister of the Ground Street Church of Christ in Wasahatchee, Texas. Uh, he's a 2009 graduate of Brown Trail School of Preaching. Uh, his wife, Tammy, and, uh, what, let me see this. Eight. Uh, eight. Eight kids. Lord, <laughs> 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 and so, uh, what brother would like to give us a good song for Brother Bruce Smith? Who would you give us a good? Brother Fish, you got something else? Yeah. Brother Turner. What happened brother, brother, brother Turner? Did he go home? <laughs> <laughs> brother Turner, he went home. He went up on the rough side of the mountain. <laughs> 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 For the next four years, Brother Bruce Smith, we're going to have a song about Brother Ryan Fish. I still have joy, you know, I still have joy after all the things I've encountered. I still have joy, you know, I still have joy. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> you know, they, 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 they help me to recognize that, that without God, I have no ability to coordinate my life. Amen. <laughs> so, so y'all just know, so if I come out like I'm, I'm, I'm cocky or arrogant, that's not the case at all. all right. Not the case at all. Amen. Uh, I've been given the task of uh, uh, dealing with the lost or the parenting this morning. And I'm thankful for the opportunity, but after after uh, Curtis Richwood's lesson, maybe I ought to just preach a sermon, uh, teach a lesson called After the Race. After the race, and you turn about 60 years old, you begin to feel tired. <laughs> and, and so, yeah. And uh, one other thing I want to clear up, uh, I actually, if all of my children were living, I would have 10 children. Huh. Now, I didn't know if the brothers picked me for this because they knew I had a bunch of children, <laughs> but uh, I did think it was ironic that I was chosen to do this particular lesson. And I'm going to say this also, just because a person has a bunch of children mm -hmm. don't mean that they understand the order of parents. Well, mm -hmm. That's being honest. All right. uh, being honest, if I was to be honest with you, I'm a much better parent now than I was with my early children. Yeah, my, yeah, I right. understand. But it's because I grew up as a man. All right. I grew up in God's word. All right. All right. And then I then I began to appreciate being a parent and being a father. Yeah. yeah. Then I I began to appreciate and understand the, the importance of teaching my children God. Yeah. Yeah. If I don't teach them anything else, if they don't become successful in anything else, just teach them God. Amen. Amen. And that's how I really feel. Wow. I, I'm not a I'm not, I do not, I have not mastered the art of parenting. Mm -hmm. I, 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 not all of my children are godly. Oh, Some of them are. <clears throat> and I bear the burden. I want you to know that. I bear the burden. And, and really, y'all, one of the, the, the uh, benefits of lessons like this, I think, now for me, as I studied this lesson, a benefit of studying this lesson was that I was able to say, God, forgive me for where I came up short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I really was. And, and see, I, I know that repentance is important because what it does, it helps me draw closer to God. Amen. It helps me to be honest with myself. And it helps me to, to, to acknowledge before God that he is God and he is right. And anything that I did contrary to his will was wrong. Right. So, so that's what... Uh, uh, if nothing else, if you, if, you, if you get that out of this lesson, then you've got a, a, a really the main thrust of this lesson. See, God had a plan for, for us in our parenting. And I know that that, uh, uh, that Neil, I think he said Neil Knight, uh, Neil Knight, when that Neil Knight comes into the world, he doesn't come with an instruction book. <laughs> Unless you are engaged in this book. Right. Amen. And I know that there are other people out there that have uh, came up with ideas about parenting. We have uh, Dr. Spock. Mm -hmm. And if you're a little bit older, you, you know about Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you really done got a little old, you know about Captain Kangaroo. <laughs> <laughs> so, so these people, and, and I know it's funny, but, but really, these people, they think they have an idea of, of parenting. And they, you know, they try to, they write books about it. But here's the reality, and I'm going to say it again, because I'm, I'm establishing this point up front. I don't care how successful our children become financially, educationally, career-wise, if our children die and go to hell, we fail. We fail. Mm -hmm. I, I, see, and I, I realize it now. I didn't, I didn't see that when I was young. Mm -hmm. I didn't see that when I was in my 20s. I began to understand it in my 30s, but now I'm, I'll be 60 in a few days, y'all. Mm -hmm. Now at 60, I realize what I should have impressed upon all of my children from the day that they entered into the world is a need to obey God. Yeah. Amen. The Bible says that it very clearly in Proverbs 6 and 2, and y'all know the verse, train, train up a child in the way that they should go Amen. so that when they are old, they will not depart. Now, I've got to be honest because I, I, I'm just going to be honest. i got some, a couple, that have departed. And I don't know, I sometimes I mourn in my heart because I, I, I know that potentially they'll be lost. And how can I how can I rejoice? You know, children are a heritage of the Lord. 
And we're supposed to be able to rejoice in it, right? Amen. But how can I rejoice if, if I know that they're lost? So for us as parents today, and I'm so glad that I got some, we got some young adults here that haven't began to raise children. And, and you know what? If, if, if my lesson is lost on all of us old heads, <laughs> and some of y'all older heads, but some of y'all older than me. <laughs> If this, if this lesson is lost on us, if, if one of them will get it, mm -hmm. it's made this time that y'all have given me worthwhile. Amen. It's Amen. made this time, if one of our, but see, I got several children here right now, and if, if one of them will get this point, if my son, Noah, will get this point, because he hasn't began to have children and raise children yet, if he'll get this point, raise your children to know God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You get that point? This made it all worthwhile. Okay, so, so now I'm going to go on and get into, into the meat of my lesson. And, and, and uh, I hope I, I can say something this morning that will uh, help you if you, if you fail at, at it, uh, uh, then repent. Uh, if you're in the midst of it, uh, shore up yes. your commitment to teaching your children about mm -hmm. God. And if you're at the end of it, and can clean some things up, yes. then do that too. See, I got some things I can clean up, with, and that's what this lesson did for me. I realized as a father, and as a, as a preacher, and as a Christian, I got some things that I can clean up oh, even God. now. And I'm, and I'm, I'm telling y'all, I'm a lot better now than I ever been. Amen. But I still have some things I can clean up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, I, and we can take it from God's word. And, I, and here's, here's the other thing, y'all. See, when I begin to do this lesson, I first got on the internet, you know, my brother said the internet is good if you use it right. I got on the internet because I said, well, they're going to want to hear some stuff that, that I probably don't know. So I'm going to get on the internet and see what the internet has to say that's very intellectually stimulating. Uh -huh. <laughs> People are starting to think, hey, that dude, that's pretty smart. <laughs> but, but I'm telling y'all I'm not. That's the first thing. <laughs> but the second thing is, I just know that God's word yeah. is true. Yeah. Yeah. And what he said is what we got to do. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay with God's word. So, so, so let me do a little bit of reading from my notes first. Uh, one of the great duties, and I can't believe I'm trying to read without my glasses. Yeah. One of the great duties uh, placed upon man from the very beginning is that he be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Yeah. And see, if you just read that, uh, all you would be doing is you would be just in the race. You would just, you know what I mean? And I promise y'all, uh, that, that's, you know, well, anyway, I'm going to go beyond that. Uh, but, but, but what man has to, say, of course, that was Genesis 1, 27, 28. Uh, but what man has to, uh, has to understand is bringing children into the world that there are some basic uh, needs, uh, some basic uh, information that we need to have to help us raise our children from infancy to dependence, mm -hmm. nurturing and caring for their needs through all of those stages leading to several lives. And that's our goal. We want to we get our children to where they are self-reliant. They can, they can stand on their own. Y'all hear that? Amen. Yeah. Y'all want to make sure they hear that. <laughs> well, we want to get, we get our children to the point where they're self-reliant. But see, what happened, what has happened is we we understand that, but we've gotten away from the basics. Mm -hmm. It's some basic things that young people need to stop uh, for self -reliance. Here's what, what children, we know that they need, and I came to realize that real soon because I worked very hard trying to provide for them. I, I've done roofing all of my life. And so I've worked very hard. But what children need, we, they come into the world, they need food, they need shelter, they need clothing. You do those three things, that's what my daddy did for me. And he had 14 children, mm -hmm. by the way, seven boys and seven girls. He provided me food, clothing, and shelter. And sometimes some of that was a little sparing, mm -hmm. but, but he got me through. But nowadays, what, what people think children need and what, what people seem to place values on is fast food, a cell phone, a brand name shoe, nice cars. I want to stop there for that. That nice car idea, y'all. My, my, my first car never never left the yard. I was proud. Literally, my first car, a Cutlass, an Oldsmobile Cutlass. 
My daddy sold it to me for three hundred dollars. Never, never got it right. <laughs> and these kids now want nice cars. I just wanted a car. So, so I'm saying that, and, and this is what I'm trying to show you: how values have changed. And our brother talked about that in, in his introduction: how our values have changed so grossly that we fail to remember what children need, what they really need. And so we, we try to provide them fast food, cell phones, name brand shoes, nice cars. They want to get tattooed. They want to get their nails done. They want to have Snapchat, TikTok, a whole lot of rest and relaxation, which was absent from my life <laughs> as a kid. So, so I'm just trying to say, uh, we, we have gotten it confused, and, and then, we, we, then the kids want to be popular. Yeah. And they want to be famous, and, and if they're not, they, they, don't, they look down on themselves, yeah. and they, they are depressed and down and out. But I'm going to tell you, that's not what God intended. Man. What God intended for, for man was not that. And so what we really, uh, really need to do is understand that children need godly parenting that leads to obedience. God. Amen. Amen. That's what they really need. Amen. We, and, and see, we we'll we'll tell our children they need to go to college and they need to do this and that. But what we ought to always be emphasizing, if you fail at college, and I tell my I tell you ask them, I tell my children this. You can fail at everything in life, but if you if you live a godly life, you have made me look successful. Amen. Amen. As a father. Man. We know that's important to God because of the qualifications that he placed on an elder. Yes. You see that in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 4, where, where he talks about the elder, one of his qualifications is he has to raise his children they have to, in gravity. They have to, he has to raise them with, with gravity, but his children have to be in subjection. Why is that? Because it, it reveals to those around him that he's raising them right. Well, he didn't say that he got to raise them when they successful in business and they got a bunch of money and just raise them to where they're in sub subjection to you. And if they're in subjection to you, then they are in subjection to God. And that's what God wants of us as parents. Godly parenting. And so need children, children need godly, children need uh, um, parenting, good godly parenting, like uh Forgiveness needs the shedding of blood. And y'all know how important that is. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there will be no remission of sin. So that's how bad our children really need godly parenting. Yeah. Yeah. They need godly parenting to get them to where they will be willing to obey God. Amen. Just look at what the Bible says about children and their state that they come into the world. Proverbs 22 and 15. Mm -hmm. Foolishness. Is bound in the heart of a child, but the raw correction should drive it far from. So, 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 in a general sense, God is letting us know that children have a, they're just going to have a level of foolishness. And what it's really talking about is they need instruction. That's it. That's it. They need direction. Exactly. It's not necessarily saying they're just going to go out there and mess up and and do wrong. I got, you know what? I got some good children now, but I still, I still know, and I've raised some good children. But I still know where their faults lie yes. and where they need a nudge here and there. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of parenting our children need as it relates to God. They need us to be nudging them yes. here and there along the way. Yes. And even when they get outside of our home, mm -hmm. we ought to be able to call them up and Amen. say, you're going to worship today. Amen. Amen. And then we ought to do like, uh, uh, like Job. And Job was a righteous man who had a lot of children. And, 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 and what the Bible says that he... He ought to sacrifice just in case his wow. children had messed up. <laughs> and we ought to pray for our children just in case oh, they're messed up. Amen. That's the kind of parenting our children need. Amen. But, but see, now, now here I'm going to use this example. When I was younger, I didn't really understand that. Amen. Mm -hmm. And now I do. And now I'm teaching my children that. And that's what, that's what uh, we, we need. And the Bible goes on to say it. Now we're talking about, we're just looking briefly at what, what the Bible says about children. And I'm, I'm looking at this from the standpoint, so I want y'all to understand my point here. I'm looking at this from the standpoint of why children need good parents. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 23 and 13, the Bible says, Withhold not correction from a child, yeah. for if thou beatest him with the rod, mm -hmm. he shall not die. Mm -hmm. So look, some of those times when we have to be firm, and not, and I'm going to use this word, not obscure, not mean, mm -hmm. or without uh, emotion or passion or love, but we have to be firm. Yeah. It's not going to hurt them. 
Amen. That's right. It's not going to kill them. <laughs> Thank you. It, it, it needs to hurt them that way, though. I'm, it, what I'm talking about, it's not going to be destructive to them. When you tell them no to something, I'm telling y'all, there, there's been times in my life when, and I'm using myself as an example again. I, I know I do that maybe too much sometimes. But there's been times in my life when I didn't stand where I should have <laughs> because I wanted I just wanted my child to have some of what they wanted. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to be happy or pleased. But I, but now I stand where I should stand. Now I'm a little bit older, and I'm still raising. I still got a, uh, one child. She's 14 years old, and I'm still raising her. And I, I know how. Hey, look, just stand on God's word. Man, mm -hmm. it may not feel comfortable because they feel like you're doing them wrong. Mm -hmm. But they need that correction, and the, and the yeah. Bible says it. Uh, uh, don't withhold correction from them, instruction yes. from them. Amen. Proverbs 23 and 14. Thou shalt be with, uh, uh, with the rod and it shall deliver his soul. That's the whole purpose of it. The purpose of good godly parenting is to deliver their souls from hell. Now look, y'all, if we have not, if our children die and go to hell, we have not been successful. They can become lawyers, doctors, whatever it is that the world holds in high esteem. If they die and go to hell, we have failed. Oh, I'm telling you, we have failed. And you can be proud, you can be as proud as you want to because your son or your daughter is doing so good financially. But if they're not serving God, Amen. It's, it's, it's a waste, it's in vain. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's what I had to come to, to realize as a parent. I had to come to realize, yeah, I want my children to, to look good and do things and live in this world and... and and all the joys and pleasures that come with this world is not sinful. I definitely want them to have. But the bottom line is they need to be saved. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so the lost sort of parenting to me is wrapped up in the fact that we, and I, and I don't know, maybe, maybe some of y'all know where I'm coming from. There are points that I, put, put it, I'm going to put it this way. There was, a never, there was never a time when a child of one of my children was conceived and I was thinking to myself, uh, like uh, Hannah over in uh, 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 First Samuel mm -hmm. One, mm -hmm. I promise y'all, I'm ashamed to say this. I, as I was doing this lesson, I don't think I ever had a child that was conceived, and I thought to myself, I'm gonna give them to the Lord. <laughs> now don't misunderstand me. I've raised my children in the church, Lord, Lord. and I taught them about God. But I'm saying that I didn't make that my goal in having a child. Come on. But I'm saying for good godly parenting. Young people, I want y'all to hear this because y'all haven't had children yet. If you want to be a good, godly parent, if, if, when you start considering having a child, do like Hannah did. And we may go over and read some of the, some of her that scripture there. But <coughs> Hannah, she, had, she told God, she made a vow. Yes. She, if, if you bless me. If you're blessing. If you, you, you sound like you can quote it. I don't think I can quote it verbatim. But <laughs> if you'll bless me with, with this child. Remember, Hannah was barren, y'all. Yeah. yeah. He said, she said, if you bless me with this child, then I'm going to give it to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and see, I wish, now I'm going to tell you, I wish I had that attitude. I didn't, and I'm not going to, so I don't want to mislead you and think, make you think I had that attitude. <laughs> but I did know enough to know that I need to have my children oh, in the church, yes. and I need to teach them about God. So yes. I did that. But I fell short. And, and, and some of us can admit that we've fallen short. Mm -hmm. We didn't have children and say, I'm going to give it back to the Lord. <laughs> but y'all young people, I want y'all to remember this. When you have children, give them to God. Amen. Let God help you raise them. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. Let God be the, the, the yes. one that, that yes. you get your instructions for yes. what to do and how to yes. to raise them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I got some. I, I, I'm gonna say it again. I got some good children, and then I got some not so good children. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 I, and I promise y'all, I can kind of see where maybe I fell short with the ones that are not. As faithful to God, the older ones that not as faithful. And then, I, and then another thing is, I, as I look around in this in this assembly, and, and I'm telling y'all, this is a sign to us. We don't have a lot of really young children oh, here. Amen. And we don't have a whole bunch of young adults here. Oh, man. This is a sign to us of, of some, some something that that, that yeah. has failed along the way. Yeah. 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 Right. I, I, and I'm not saying that to Amen. make us to to, to 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 criticize us. I'm saying that for us to think about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and be more focused. But, but now, let me get let me get on to my 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 notes here. Get back to my notes like I got them constructed. <laughs> uh, uh, first of all, y'all, 
and I've already talked about this, we need to command our children. We need to insist on them. I got children, adult children, the little man, so I can use this example because I'm, I'm living up to this standard. You can't live in my house and not go to worship on Sunday. Amen, brother. Amen. 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 You, 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 can, you can come visit. I'll let you come visit. <laughs> but if you live under this roof, yes. and guess what? You, you, you might live on God in the rest of the week, and I don't know. Yes. But you're going to be at worship on Sunday. Yes, and here is why that's important. In Genesis 18, y'all, and I want y'all to just look at what God said about Moses, I mean, uh, Abraham. Uh-huh. And this is important to me because I know if God feels this way about Abraham and him commanding his children, maybe God will consider me if I command mine. Yes. This is what the Bible says. In Genesis 18 and 17, the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? And y'all know the thing he's getting ready to do. He's getting ready to go down and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Because of sin, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He, and, and he says, shall I hide this from Abraham? And look at God's consideration for Abraham. He says, seeing that Abraham shall surely be, uh, become a, a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, for I know him, this is powerful to me, yeah. for I know him that he will command his children his and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, and the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which yes. he has spoken of him. Mm-hmm. All right. So, so, so here's what I'm, I'm saying to myself as I, as I, as I live in my life. So, so if God considered the fact that Abraham was going to be committed to being obedient to him by Commanding his children and teaching his children, if I do that, will God show me some consideration to you? Mm-hmm. You know what? I can say this. For the first half of my life, God probably wouldn't have said that about me. But I pray that he said it about me now. Amen. Amen. And, 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 and you know what? And sometimes I may have to say to my children, you know, yeah, I know I, we did that wrong, but we ain't doing that no more. Yes. We're going to do it right. <laughs> I may have to say that. But I want God to be able to say about me, I know him. He's going to com- command his children. You want to talk about the lost art of parenting? Lord, Lord. It lies right there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Dr. Spock can't teach me that. Oh, Come on now. Captain Kangaroo won't teach me that. He's gone now. See, y'all don't know about Captain Kangaroo. A lot of y'all know. Uh, Captain, I grew up with Captain Kangaroo. Mr. Green Jim. Y'all remember Mr. Green Jim? I grew up with him. So, so, so God placed the importance on the fact that Abraham would command his household. And then, he, then as we move forward in, in the history of God's dealing with man, we see the importance that he placed on it in his law. If you, if you look with me, he wanted them to teach them diligently, he said. In, in uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse number 10, the Bible says, uh, especially the David, and now he, uh, this is Deuteronomy, he's giving them the law again. Deuteronomy is second giving them the law. And he's having to give it a second time. Why? Because of sin. And now he's reminding them that, hey, I, now y'all keep this word. The one that y'all, the word that you broke earlier, y'all need to keep this word. It's going to keep coming back to God, uh, y'all. And I, yeah. I, our lives as Christians is going to keep coming back to God as parents. It's going to keep coming back to God if we want to do it right. Yeah. And this is what he said, especially the day that thou, should, that thou stood before uh, the Lord, the God of glory. When the Lord said unto me, gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and they may teach their children. God wants us to teach our children God. Yeah. Yeah. And he emphasizes it here. And of course, y'all, I know this emphasized in, in more places just in this. But but Deuteronomy 6. Yeah, that's it. He's here, you know, he told them, teach them by, as you walk by the way, as you get up and as you sit down, and, 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 and to teach them by the in your doorway. And God wants us to emphasize God yeah. in our parenting. We can teach our children to get a job. They gonna, we're going to teach them that. <laughs> you got to get a job. We're going to struggle with them. We teach our children, you need to get out of my house. Yeah. You, need, you need to go get your own place. We're going to teach them that. But I'm telling you, from, their, from, from that point when they're born, we start teaching them God and make sure we do it diligently so that when they're old, they won't depart. And the Bible emphasized that. It was always God's intention, even in marriage. And, I, and I'm using this example from Malachi chapter 2 and verse 15. When, when God is talking to, to um, Israel, and you all know the history of how 
They had broken God's covenant throughout the history of Israel. And even now at this point, God is rebuking the priests in, it, in uh, Malachi chapter uh, uh, 1 and, and 2. Uh, but uh, in Malachi 2.15, he talks to them about marriage. He said this, and did he not make one, talking about marriage, did he not make one, yet he, that, uh, he, uh, he the residue of the spirit and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. God's, I, that's what I want to bring out of this. God's whole point in parenting, yeah. in marriage first of all, but in raising our children is to seek a godly seed. Yeah. Not to seek a uh, and I, I, God knows I wish my son had played football and he made a, that one multi-million dollar contract, but I ain't gonna lie and say, I didn't have those visions back when he was young because he was a pretty good football player. And I was like, when he was in some way, I said, boy, that's my money right there. <laughs> 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 I'm just being honest. I was, well, I was hopeful. But the point is, y'all, God ain't seeking a football player to make a million dollar contract. Amen. Oh, He's seeking a godly seed. Amen. And that's what we got to, we, as parents, we got to just keep that ever present in our mind. Yeah. Yeah. The order of uh, the, the lost order in, 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 the, in the church. I, I see it. I've seen it everywhere. I traveled uh, and when I was at Brown Trail and even before I, uh, when I was at between full time work. I would preach in these different communities. I would, they would call me from the school, and, and I would go out and preach. And I'm telling y'all, most of the congregations were filled with older people. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that tells me something. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the way, we failed in seeking a godly seed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. And, and, uh, and it may not even be your fault. I know good godly people that did their best to raise mm -hmm. yeah. God's children. Come on. They're still and and uh, the children still yeah. went astray. So I know that. Yeah. And I know that I've been fairly <laughs> consistent in trying to raise my children in, in the church and to know God. <clears throat> and yet I have some that, that I don't know if they're going to be faithful or not. But I know this. I can operate in such a way that my conscience is clear. Yeah. Amen. 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 I can't operate in such a way that, that I've done everything that God Lord, has said, said to me. Said to yes. me. Yeah. And that is that, that I train them up, I nurture them in the wisdom and the nurture of the Lord. Yes. Yes. And then they got to make a decision toward yeah. them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I can have the confidence of knowing I did my part. And then I'm gonna, I know my time is, uh, uh, is spent. Uh, so I mentioned Deuteronomy. I'm going to close with that passage of Scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 6, and because that's where uh, we all ultimately need to do. That's what all of us need to do, those of us who are raising children and grandchildren. Yeah. Uh, we we got to make this the main point of our nurture, the main point of our teaching. we gotta, we got to keep God ever present before them. we got to stand on God's Word. In their lives. They, got, they need to see that in us. In Deuteronomy 6, in verse number 6, and y'all know, know the verse, but let's read it. And it'll, it'll jog our memory. And these words which I have commanded thee this day shall be in thy heart. That's the first thing about uh, the law of the parent. We need to have God's word in our heart, in God's law in our heart. And then we that thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets before thy eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on the gate. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swore unto thy father, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob to give thee great and good cities, which thou buildest them. Uh, I'll close, I'll stop there. But the point, once again, is simply <coughs> this, that for us as Christians, now we're not talking about the world, because the world don't care. For us as, as Christians, I would say, if we have failed to, to raise our children to know God in a consistent and, and, and a diligent and organized way, then we, we do have, we have what I would identify uh, 
feel that the heart turns in our children. Because the heart is found in God and doing it this way. Amen. 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 Personal experience and uh, Gabe Bison, he did a great job. So, we're going to ask uh, just a moment, we're about to prepare to go and have lunch. Uh, we're going to ask Brother Crosby to give us a verse of song in just a moment, and then Brother Shea is going to ask him to give us a prayer uh, to uh, for lunch, uh, to end us for lunch, and to pray for the food. And so, uh, after lunch, uh, we should be. Lunch should be from 12 to 1 p.m. Uh, it seemed like there was a 30 minute. Uh, let me see, I see. From 11.30 to 12. So we'll, we'll, we'll go as planned. So uh, lunch is from 12 to 1. Then we'll have a devotional from 1 to 1.30. Uh, and depending on if everybody is able to eat, we may have to play at that time a little bit. Uh, but then at 1.30, we'll start our session back up. Uh, the ladies will be in, in uh, our life center here in the back. And we, uh, Sister um, Ada Marie Crosby, um, her subject is crisis in the church, lack of respect for modesty. Mm -hmm. And that's for the women. Mm -hmm. And for the men, we have Brother Richard Stevens, uh, crisis in the church, lack of respect for authority. Mm -hmm. And so two great lessons that uh, we should be eager to hear uh, these lessons. And so we're going to ask Dallas Hillside to let our guests go first in eating. We're going to ask you when you eat to eat and then just go ahead and let somebody else get your seat uh, because we don't have an hour of time, so we don't have a lot of time just to sit and socialize. Uh, and so uh, but we want everybody to have a good time, make sure you get enough to eat and we have enough for everyone to eat. But you don't eat it here. Yeah, but just don't eat it here. <laughs> and, uh, and don't get mad at me. Get mad at my wife. She she came back to my office and said, "You make sure you tell nobody to eat in here." <laughs> and so we're gonna follow Sister Pamela Smith. Uh, so this time we're gonna ask Brother Crosby to give us a verse of a song, and then Brother Shea to come up and give us a prayer uh, for the relationship and for our food. Let's get the stand. Jesus, my heavenly King, loves me, I know. Praises to Him, I sing, onward I go. Praises to Him, I plead, blessings still flow.
and enjoy the other blessings of food that you have blessed us with. We thank you for those who have prepared it. Amen. We ask that this will be a success and that it will help us to grow together. Yes. Yes. To be that community of people that you would have us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.